All right, peace to you, ladies and gentlemen. How are you? Now, in today's video, I just want to talk about something which has seen as a virtue in the modern world, but I've come to question recently, and that is the concept of empathy, sympathy, uh, the bleeding heart, and feeling for your enemies and feeling for people. And after thinking about it for a while, actually, let me let me give you a little bit of backstory. So oftentimes, especially nowadays, with considering the whole Palestine-Israel war, people, they ask me, they, Walid, why don't you feel bad for these people? Why do, and, and, you know, it's got me thinking about the concept of empathy and sympathy as a whole. So what would we define empathy as? Sympathy. It's feeling another person's pain and then wanting to alleviate that suffering because you feel their pain. And is that even a useful quality to have? Is that even a Quranic quality? And personally, I don't see that at all. I don't see that at all. Okay? So, if you read the Quran, the the sole criterion... And by the way, sorry if I don't look so good. Right now I'm in my dirty work clothes. I have a do-rag on and a dusty hoodie and flannel. But that's fine. I can still make a video. But as I was saying, so... The, the sole duty in the Quran or the Quranic philosophy is that... the the reason why the believers do things is because God has commanded them, okay? Th this idea that our feelings, how we feel, oh, I feel another person's pain, or I feel any which way, and this is going to dictate the course of my actions, that is not Quranic. There is one thing that dictates our actions, and that is the command of God. And that stands authoritative without care without any reference to our feelings. If we feel great about it, cool. If we don't, it doesn't matter. We still got to do it, okay? So, that, that again, that, that's really what empathy is, right? It's feeling bad for somebody and then wanting to alleviate their suffering. Well, no, that's not Quranic, all right? In the Quran, we have so many cold but real examples, nonetheless, of just this tough love, not even love. It, it's pure cold-heartedness towards an evil-doing people. And this relates to the issue of Palestine as well, because, you know, Palestine, people want to feel bad for them, what's going on. And the, personally, the way I see this war, this whole thing playing out, is I see two kafir spurning guidance while claiming virtue, people, Israel and Palestine, and they're just going at it with each other and destroying one another. There are two people who have, in large portion, abandoned their holy book, the Israelites. They've abandoned the Torah for man-made traditions and secularism. Look at look at the state of Israel today. It's, it's just a total secular nation. And same thing with the Palestinians and most Hadithans in the world. They've abandoned the word of God for man-made traditions. So I just see two kafir people fighting with each other. But as I was saying about empathy, we have over and over in the Quran a, a very cold-heartedness, uh, a cold-hearted demeanor towards an evil-doing people. I can name you verse after verse. So, and, and even just so many verses refuting the idea that our feelings and because we feel bad about people, that that should be the basis for the actions that we take. And let's start with, and I'm not going to quote them exactly. I'll have them up on screen, but just things that are coming to my mind is... Firstly, um, I can't remember which prophet it was, but after, a, I think it was Noah, but after a people were destroyed, he said, should I grieve for a people who are kafirs? Should I grieve for a people who spurn guidance while claiming virtue? That's pretty tough. That's pretty cold. I mean, these people, they were literally drowned alive and they're going to, I mean, if, if it's about Noah, but either way, there was a group of people which were destroyed as a punishment of God and they're going to end up going into the fire in the hereafter to burn forever. And did he feel bad for them? Am I to, am I to feel empathy? Am I to feel sympathy for them? No. Do I grieve for people who spurn guidance while claiming virtue? No, they're destroyed. Another verse that comes to my mind is, is it not away with the evil doing people? That's pretty cold. Another one that comes to my mind is when God says uh, that they plan and God plans and God is the best of planners and they scheme and God schemes and God is the best of schemers. OK, we have God literally dividing, devising, excuse me, a plot against the evil doing people. And they think that they're going to control their world. Reminds you of what Joker said. They're all schemers, they, schemers. They think that they're controlling their little world and everything like that. And they're plotting and planning against goodness. They're plotting evil. And th they themselves are caught up in a plot and God is going to humiliate them. God's going to show them who's truly in power and who's in control. And it's not them with their schemes and plots, but it's God Almighty who controls all things. Another verse that comes to my mind is the one where, or at least it's a story in the Quran, where Abraham, when he was commanded to sacrifice his son, he didn't feel any empathy and sympathy towards his son. God, Remember, the, the, 
the basis for our decisions is the commandment of God, okay? That's it. Not feeling for people, not having this bleeding heart, this conscience, that makes no difference for us, okay? Because when he was commanded to sacrifice his son, he went for it and he didn't feel for the pain that, and of course, God stopped it. He said, you've confirmed the vision and everything like that. And obviously God intervened. He was just testing Abraham's faith, but he didn't feel bad for his son in that moment. Even his son was stoic about it. He said, God, you know, or not God, he said, Father, do it to me. That's why if God has commanded it, then I'm not going to fight you against it. Both of them, they didn't feel any empathy or sympathy. He didn't feel it for himself, the son, neither did Abraham feel it for his son. And this is extolled as a great virtue in the Quran, right? Obeying God no matter what. Obeying God no matter what. Another story that comes to my mind is the example of traditionally the man who's called Al-Khidr. I, I call him the mysterious man. The one whom Moses met on his journey. And remember, he wasn't patient with him. Well, that man, he slew a kid or a young lad, a young boy, right? And then Moses wasn't patient with him. But then after once the interpretation was made clear to him, he said to him that this was an evil doing boy. And somehow, I don't know if he was a human or some kind of angel, who knows what this guy was, right? That Moses met on his journey. But either way, somehow he had great, not greater than even the prophet. And he had foreknowledge. He had knowledge of the future. God had revealed to him that this was going to be an evil doing lad and that God would wanted that kid to be destroyed by him to be killed by him and he would replace the the parents of that child who had the evil doing kid they they were righteous people and he was going to replace that son with the new righteous son right was there any feeling bad i'm sure that was painful when he slew him i don't think he calmly sedated him it was probably something fairly dramatic and god doesn't hold him to account for it neither does moses there was no sympathy or empathy there right again the command of god must be carried out Another verse that comes to my mind in the Quran is with, or another story, or not actually, it's one of the laws in the Quran. It's regarding sexual immorality. When a people commit sexual immorality, when they commit abomination, you find them adultery. So a man's wife sleeping with another man and just things like that. When you apprehend them both, you are to lash them. You are to lash them repeatedly. And the Quran says that let not pity for a people hold you back from carrying out the command of God. So right now you're lashing them over and over. Their skin is bleeding. They're lacerated. They're screaming out in pain and agony. And what does God say? He says, don't let, basically, don't let your bleeding heart, don't let your empathy hold you back. Do and carry out the command of God. So this whole idea that I should feel bad for people. And of course, we have empathy and sympathy for the believers and our family, our blood family, our extended family, and those who are good to us. We have a loyalty towards them. Certainly, no problem about that. But the broader world, the evil doing society that surrounds people who want to kill me. I mean, th these, just think about it. If you're a Quran alone Muslim, you follow the word of God. These people, most of these hadiths in the world, if right now they're in, in the West, they're very calm because they're not in power. It's a secular atheist who runs a show here. But if these people were in power, they ran the government, they ran the system, they would want to kill you and me. Okay. They would have no mercy towards us at all. Okay. I'm not saying all of them, but generally speaking, this is how they are, right? Of course, if one is kind to you, be kind to them. But the overall mentality of this hadith and religion is that we're kafirs and that our head is to be taken for that reason, that we're, we're to be hurt, right? We're, we're fair game because we blaspheme the holy prophet. And um, of course we don't. We're just trying to defend the prophet from all the accretions and all the bad things that they've said about him, all the false things that they've said and given authority to. But nonetheless, they don't care. Most of these people, if you're a Quran or a Muslim, they would hurt you. So why should I feel sympathy and empathy towards them? And again, show me in the Holy Writ, the Word of God, where this idea of that because I'm feeling another person's pain, that therefore this should be the compass by which my actions are guided. I don't see that anywhere. I see a very cold, blunt philosophy in the Quran is if God commands it, it is done. If God is commanded, it is done. No matter how you feel about it, God even says in the Quran that you may not like a thing, but it is good for you. And you may like a thing, but it is bad for you. God makes it very clear in the Holy Quran. I, I don't see any credence being given to feelings. And actually, God calls them vain desires, those who follow their vain desires. And it, it makes me think of everything I've done in my life. And it, it it's coming into full fruition. I'm starting to really understand the motivation for my actions. When I give charity to people, when I help people, let's say a random person on the street because God tells us to give charity. My wife and I, we try to give fruits, bananas, apples, figs, nuts, whatever we can whenever somebody's asking. I don't do it for the person. 
I don't do it for the person. I do it because my Lord has commanded me. Everything I do, it's because my Lord has commanded me. What, what, what is this idea that I should feel their pain? I don't see that in the scriptures. And even when they tell me, oh, thank you so much for helping me out. And I say, don't thank me. Thank the Most High, right? I'm just doing my duty here, right? This is somebody I, I met on the street just right now who's begging for food. I, I would be lying to myself. I would be kidding. I would be a virtue signaling, actually dishonest person if I were to pretend like I really cared about them in that moment I don't I only care about pleasing my Lord my Lord has commanded me charity so I'm going to carry out charity in that moment and it reminds me of a time and people would this they're appalled at this doctrine of but it this is the essence of pure submission to the most high we don't even care about our feelings we don't even care about feeling another person's pain if they're liable to feel that pain and god has commanded them to be punished in that moment then we are to put that aside it, it's not a useful trait to have empathy and sympathy what is a useful trait is total submission total 100% submission to the command of God. And it reminds me of a story of a time where my wife, she gave charity to a person and I'm not going to give names or anything like that, but somebody who was involved with her family, uh, she commented on that and they, they started getting in a back and forth discussion about charity. And my wife said, and sh she said the fact, the truth that she gives this to honor the Lord. And the person who she was talking to said, well, are you, are you giving it to for the Lord? You're giving it to honor the Lord? You should do it for the person. And my wife said, no, I'm fundamentally, first and foremost, I'm doing it for God. And she said, no, first you're supposed to do it for the person because you feel their pain and then for God afterwards. It's a totally backwards mentality. And actually, it's a form of self-worship to think that your feelings on a matter, wh whether you feel bad for somebody's pain or whether on the reverse end you feel bad for yourself, whatever, that our feelings should be the arbiter for how we determine our actions. No. It's the command of God. Fundamental. Full stop. There's no debating that. Even we have in the Quran, another thing that comes to my mind, verses keep coming to my mind, is, I mean, think about, I'm told that I should feel bad for these people and all that, and even though it's a judgment of God, God makes it clear regarding the Palestinians and the Israelis for that matter. If they both perish, I don't care. Honestly, I'm just waiting for this full-blown war to break out and I, I want this idolatrous house this so-called Kaaba this holy house in Mecca the day that thing gets bombed and blown to bits I, I will be celebrating in the street praise the Lord praise the Lord the house of idolatry is gone praise God I'll be thanking him but again this idea you know th this this whole thing that I'm supposed to feel bad whatever pain the Palestinians or the Israelis or whoever is going through there's no greater pain in this whole world, in the whole existence of anything, than hell. Hell is the greatest, most excruciating pain, and it is also everlasting. And what does God say about the evil-doing people? And what does God say about the righteous people who attain paradise? What they will be saying about the evil-doing people? God's saying, we're going to laugh. We're going to laugh right? If there was any moment in time I am to have empathy, have sympathy, feel bad for another person's pain, it's now. This is the worst pain anyone will ever feel in their life, and it's going to last forever, and there's no hope for them. God says, be you patient or impatient. It doesn't matter for you. They will neither die nor live therein. They're in there for eternity, and we're going to laugh. We're going to have a gloat if God may the Lord have mercy on us and allow us to enter into the garden, but that is the Quranic mentality. That is the Quranic mentality. There is no sympathy for evil doing people, and everything is a judgment of God. Okay? Everything is a judgment of God. If you look, God makes it very clear, at least regarding the Palestinian and Israeli people and what's going on with them. God says that if okay, nations are judged based on the total of their output, so the majority of people and what they do, what they adhere to, what they subscribe to, their morality, their submission to the Most High, that is what nations are judged on. Now, there may be certain righteous people within the midst who might get caught in the crossfire, and God will make a way for them out. God always protects the righteous people. But generally, when great calamity strikes a city or a nation, it's because most of their people are evil doing. Okay? So, What's going on right now in Palestine, I consider that as a judgment of God. God makes it clear if the majority, as in the case of, uh, let's say, Jonah, right? That, that, that's the only time we have, as far as I can remember in the Quran, where a multitude of people, the majority, repented and turned to the Most High. And God says he extended their time. God says in the Quran that if a people 
decide to follow God alone and behave righteously according to what is moral and right and what he has revealed, that he will open the sky upon them in torrents, rain upon rain. He's going to give them crops and flourish them. This is what God does to a righteous people. But when you are evil, there's only one category of people I see in the Quran who are left in utter abomination and desolation, and that is evil doing people. And as tough as it may sound, but I see the Palestinian, not, not saying I see the Israeli as right, I see the Palestinian, I see the Israeli, and I see, Lord willing, the destruction coming of the Hadithan people. I see it all in that light. And right now, Palestine is the beginning of the destruction of the wicked Hadithan and what he's done. His total abnegation of the word of God, his total misrepresentation, his total idolatry with Muhammad, this whole idea of Hadith and that even let's just say if it's the words of Muhammad, then we have no idea, right? But that the words of Muhammad are of equal authority to the words of God. This idea, I mean, they have a hadith that Muhammad's name, the Shahada, is written on God's throne. This is a total shirk and idolatry. This whole idea that we are to circle around and bow down to this black box. This is idolatry to the highest degree. These people have misrepresented the Quran so badly in this world. So badly. It seems like every time I tell people I'm I'm Muslim, I believe in the Quran, I believe that there's one God, I, I do believe that Muhammad is a prophet, I follow the scripture that was revealed to the prophet Muhammad. I, th the first obstacle I have to overcome is I need to defrag and disabuse their mind of all the things they think Islam is because of the mishandling of these hadithans. The same very hadithans who if they could get their hands on people like me and you, they would kill. And now I'm supposed to feel bad for them? I don't think so. I don't think so. They're getting what they deserve. And the hadithan nations, this war that's coming, Lord knows best when it's going to come, but this World War III, we're going to see the total dissolution, the involution of the hadith, and he's going to get what he deserves for misrepresenting the Quran and persecuting true Muslims. So, as the Quran says, shall I grieve for a people who spurn guidance while claiming virtue? Shall I grieve for a kafir people? No. I have no sympathy for my enemies at all. You guys are my enemies, not my brothers and sisters, especially after what you've done, misrepresenting the Most High in his words. <sighs> like I said, I like my evildoers. Well done. Nice and charbroiled. That's the way I see it. And if you don't like that, then take that up with God in the Quran. Because again, I don't see anywhere in the Quran this idea of sympathy for our enemies. Or, um, of course, if they repent and change and turn to the Most High, that's totally different. They're not your enemies anymore. They're your brothers. You have forgiveness for them. But so long as they stay as your enemies and just this idea that my feelings, that how I feel for a people, empathy, that this should be the, the compass that guides my actions. I don't see that anywhere in the Quran. I see a cold, meticulous, calculated carrying out of the plan of God, no matter what. This goes to the story of Abraham which was commanded to sacrifice his son, and he was about to, then God stopped it. The story of Al-Khidr, the mysterious man who killed the lad, and this goes on and on in the Quran. But anyways, ladies and gentlemen, that's really all I got to say on the matter. I hope this talk was a blessing. And yeah, peace to you. Remember, the seed abounds, so keep your eyes wide open. Peace out. Peace and blessings in the name of the Most High, viewer. My name is Walid Naim, and I am a zealous submitter to the one true God the creator of all mankind. Do you notice something wrong with the world? Something strange? Despite us having a church, synagogue, and mosque in every neighborhood, how has this entire Western civilization fallen into abject atheism, nihilism, and savagery? Why does life just seem so dull, so meaningless, and so devoid of anything real in the Occidental world? Despite the ubiquitous presence of these religious institutions, why are our so-called Muslim sons in large numbers drinking, smoking, partying, and chasing after women, with no seeming desire to do anything more with their life other than satisfy their base pleasures, when God has commanded them to be clean, righteous, and responsible leaders of their community? And why are our hijabi so-called Muslim daughters walking around with tight jeans that reveal their figure with TikTok accounts posting semi-provocative self-absorbed videos of themselves online for the world to see when God has commanded them to lengthen their garments and be modest in their mannerisms. What has happened here? These young men and women are supposed to be making themselves right before God while raising the next generation of ardent defenders of the holy faith. But it seems that Islam features no more in their lives other than a scarf on their head, a Friday fidgeting around in the mosque when their parents force them to go against their will, or a decorative hanger in their car. 
At this rate, if God allows us to continue going down the road it is, then Islam and the Qur'an will become pretty much non-existent in the lives of most of our descendants, if it wasn't already non-existent now. If we do not take a stand soon, in a few generations our children's children will likely be indistinguishable from the secular West. Is that the kind of world we want to live in? Our kids to live in? A world practically devoid of the remembrance of the one God and all things sane? I obviously can't speak for you, but for my own self, I can personally say, count me out of it. I'm not going to sit here and just watch my brothers and sisters, those who claim to believe in God alone, believe in Judgment Day, His prophets and angels, and all the other aspects of this holy creed, get duped into going to hell. I am not going to let this happen without at least something of an effort on my end to reroute this dark trajectory. So, again, how in the world do we end up here? There is a mosque in practically every neighborhood in the West, and no shortage of donations that get dropped in their boxes. They have had lots of funding, lots of time, and unquestioning support from their respective congregations, yet somehow have been run over by the secular atheist. All of their so-called Muslim children go to the atheist, secular public schools for most of their week to be taught beliefs that are completely incompatible with the Qur'an. And we wonder why they have ended up the way they are. If these houses, and by these houses I mean the mosques, were truly of God that were doing everything right, then why would our Lord let them get so decisively trampled upon by their enemies? Why do the wicked have all of the reins of power here? Clearly, something is not adding up. Well, it is my thesis here today that the vast, vast majority of mosques that exist in this world today have lost their way and follow a religion which is completely foreign to the Qur'an. This is why they have failed so miserably in the West, and it seems that God has forgotten them. In truth, the real reason behind their shortcoming is that they, and many of us, have forgotten God himself, which is why he has left us here collecting our bitter receipts. So, what are my exact criticisms of the mosques today? As a Muslim, and a man committed to the truth above all else, what are my personal gripes with their institution, which claims to be for God? The first glaring problem I can think of is that the majority of people who call themselves Muslim have allied themselves with a body of literature that is foreign to the Word of God, treating it equal to, and in fact above the Qur'an itself. Of course, I am talking about the Hadith. Listen, the facts are this. There is no justification within the Qur'an which tells us to follow this Hadith stuff, which came hundreds of years after the Prophet Muhammad died, and therefore he could have had no ability to oversee what people have said about him, and determine if it is true or false. It is now becoming crystal clear, especially in the last 10-20 to 20 years, that many, many things that have been ascribed to him in their most quote-unquote authoritative texts, which they call their Sahih Hadiths, are forgeries that directly contradict God's final revelation. To take these words of men, i.e. the Hadith, and hold them to be equally authoritative to the words of God would be breaking the first and most important commandment, which is to worship God alone, making no equals with him. To say that these supposed words of Muhammad, which are not even Muhammad's own words, but simply very doubtful rumors about what people who existed hundreds of years after him say he said, that have been decided upon by the scholars as authoritative holds equal, or in fact any weight in our faith comparable to the verbatim words of God himself, the Holy Qur'an, is idolatry. You are exalting man's words to the status of divinity, which should only be given to God's words. Nothing comes even close to the Qur'an, because God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, is its author. This includes the Hadith too, which pales in comparison and is superfluous to the glorious Qur'an. If you are interested in seeing a full refutation of the Hadith, you may watch my video titled, A Defense of Prophet Muhammad, David Wood and Hadith Exposed, which is linked below. In it, along with refuting and putting in his place the worst opponent of Islam on the internet, Mr. David Wood, I also expose how the Hadith is completely contradictory to the Qur'an and the source of much of the Muslim world's problems. It is a two-hour long documentary where I seek to demonstrate the true character of Muhammad in the Qur'an, defending his history and personality with primary source quotations. I clear the last prophet of God's name from the people who have tarnished his reputation the most, which are certain types of Christians, and, sad to say, hadith-following Muslims, which have said many terrible things about him. No, Muhammad was not a money-hungry, tyrannical warlord who married a six-year-old girl. He was a shy, humble, 
meek man who married adult women, had compassion for even his worst enemies, and oftentimes had a tough time even standing up for himself out of fear of hurting other people's feelings. This is all demonstrated in detail in my video. Once again, the link for that will be in the description under the tab, The True Character of Muhammad in the Quran. So that is the first problem with the mosques, the reason for which I feel they have been forsaken by God, their adoption of an apostate literature which contradicts their foundational scripture. The second point of contention I have with many of the mosques is their seeming unwillingness to say anything controversial which may make them face persecution from their government. The fact that 9-11 was not only an inside job, but the fact that no planes hit the Twin Towers on that day, and the whole charade was a hoax designed by the governments of the world to forever frame the Muslim people as terrorists and justify invasions in our countries, should be taught to every man, woman, and child. This great fraud of the September attacks has left such a lasting, enduring reputation on every brown person, and Muslim in general, that it should be discussed in every mosque. Our people are not responsible for that crime, but it was the governments of the world who carried out that plot and framed us for it. 9-11 is just only one small example, though. There are many, many other quote-unquote conspiracy theories, which are really just conspiracy facts, avoided by the mosques due to their controversy, like the fact that the monetary system in the West is an ungodly scam based on usury, the fact that the so-called healthcare system is a predatory empire which doesn't try to cure anybody but instead makes money off of human suffering, the fact that sodomite propaganda is being promoted to the masses, including our children, and the fact that the thing which I will call the c 19 er to avoid censorship, was a hoax perpetrated by the powers that be to greatly expand their police state, censorship incentives, and surveillance systems worldwide in order to create their new world order, and much more. These governments that have occupied our lands are de facto terrorist regimes, and the mosques seem to say nothing of it. They appear to be more concerned with not being labeled extremists while they live their comfortable, well-funded lives, avoiding topics that are hard to deal with due to the abject persecution they bring. That is my second problem with them. They're at the very least lack of awareness, or if not, perhaps lack of willingness to address the real geopolitical situation going on in the world. And lastly, my third trouble with the mainstream mosques, which can also be put into the category of conspiracy facts, is their complete ignorance on the true nature of the earth. It may sound as a shock to you, my viewer, that the Quran, the Bible, and in fact all of the ancient scriptures teach the earth is flat and stationary. This is the only model of the world which is compatible with those texts, and also scientifically provable. This flat earth conspiracy, which should really be called the globe earth conspiracy, is one of the biggest lies of the modern world we are told, and goes in line with what I said earlier about the endemic corruption of the governments of the world. Everything you have been told about where you live is a fabrication, and the space agencies are a shameless hoax. For a fully detailed presentation on the subject of Flat Earth, where I demonstrate the science, the history, the philosophy, the verses in the Bible and Quran proving it, and much more, you can read my book titled The Flat Earth Manifesto, which is linked in the description. This work runs to nearly 1,200 pages and is practically a textbook on not only the topic of Flat Earth, but the subject of physics proper, and I expose the biggest fraudulent religion of the West, which is science worship, otherwise known as scientism. As with all of my work, it too is available for free. No, you do not live on a pathetic speck of dust spinning around in the middle of nowhere in space. You live in a brilliant, intelligently designed terrarium created by God and are at the center of the universe. Again, to learn more, the link to the Flat Earth Manifesto will be in the description. Those right there are my three biggest scores against the mosques of today. There are more points I could bring up, but these are the major ones. These are the controversies which have estranged me from the rest of the so-called Muslim world. Believe me when I say that I would love to join them and that it hurts me so deeply that I have to pit myself up against the very institution I was born and raised in, the mosques I attended from childhood whose carpets upon which I walked, stood, prayed, and listened to the preaching in my earliest years. But that is the price to pay for the truth. My commitment to God and what is right is more important than my emotional attachments to a place that was once dear to my heart. Simply put, this is why I think God has forsaken us. This is why I think that the mosques have been steamrolled by the secular atheist. It is because most of us have abandoned the word of God, 
neglected preaching the truth, and instead chosen comfort over courageous action. That is my thesis to why this great falling away in the West has taken place. If this sounds shocking to you, if it sounds so unbelievable that the majority of the so-called Muslim world could be deceived so badly, then I simply have these verses in the Quran to show you. In the name of God, the Almighty and the Merciful. Chapter 6, verse 116. And if thou obey most of those upon the earth, they will lead thee astray from the path of God. They follow only assumption, and they are only guessing. Chapter 25, verse 30. And the messenger will say, O oh my Lord, my people took this Qur'an as a thing abandoned. God has really predicted this a millennia ago. He knew that the people who follow what is really right are few and far between, that the majority of men and women are led astray, and the people who claim to love Muhammad the most, i.e. mainstream Muslims, would abandon the glorious Qur'an. God has revealed to us a thousand years ago that this all would be the case. It is my mission, therefore, by the will of God, to band together with like-minded believers who have understood the truth and work together to build a new institution from the ground up, founded upon prudent fear. We need to start fresh, start anew. We need to build a new mosque where people can hear the unfiltered preaching from the Quran alone, where men and women can get married, where children can play and be educated in the truth, and where the name of the Most High God, without any associate partners, can be remembered. We need a group of highly dedicated men who will raise and defend this institution with their own hands if need be, and go out into the world warning people of the punishment of God, bearing witness to the truth of his oneness. That is my mission, my viewer. If you found that this mission of mine has touched your heart and is something you want to get involved with, then feel free to contact me in the email below. I am located in Ontario, Canada, and I'm looking forward to form a community with like-minded believers who want to contribute to this great cause. I am neither a nationalist nor racially biased. If you follow the Quran alone and believe in the truth, then as far as I'm concerned, you are my brother in the faith. I prefer you over someone of my own kindred who denies God and commits corruption in the earth. My loyalties are primarily ideological, not racial. Remember, my viewer, that this life is short. Everything we do and don't do is recorded by God and will either bear witness for us or against us on the day of judgment. Hell is eternal, and I do not know about you, but as for me, I want to meet my Creator in the best state possible. I want to spend my life struggling to build up my people, the true Muslims, so that God may be pleased with me on that day. If you are interested in that, then feel free to join me. If not, then find something else good to do which will prepare you for your appointment with the Most High. That is where we are all going anyway. With that being said, I say peace and God bless to all of you good people. Take care, everyone.